Hello and welcome to a new video from Juggler66, Hour of the Truth. This is already part 8 of the reading and discussion of the, and reading discussion and explanation, I would even like to say, of the book The Origin of Futurism and Preterism, as this is the second part of the evening on the 19th of April here at my home over in Europe, where there is evening, there is noon in the United States of America. This eighth part is just the second part of the seventh that we've just had after a little break. So I'm still with my brother Brett Norman in Minnesota and uh, brother Tom Fress in the United States also from Inquisition Update, who are here and will assist me in reading and discussing this wonderful book, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. And we are now in the last chapter of the first part of the book. The first part of the book, as you remember probably, dealt with the origins of futurism and preterism. And um, this last chapter is called Misunderstanding and Misapplication of Scripture. After that we will go into part two, that is written by Charles A. Jennings. And um, that of course then deals with futurism, the tragic aftermath of futurism that is called. But for the moment we have Misunderstanding and Misapplication of Scripture. So I will read and my brothers will interrupt me whenever they have a comment, as that is understood and also done so in the other parts before. So enjoy and please concentrate or even read along in the own copy, in your own copy of the book. I'm on page 37, Misunderstanding and Misapplication of Scripture. The misunderstanding that all prophecy has been fulfilled, that's preterism, leaves much to be desired. The Jews in Jerusalem misunderstood Christ's first coming, and the preterists misunderstand his second coming. Most historicists find it ludicrous to believe that the Holy Spirit inspired the writers of Matthew 24 and Luke 21, and directed the Apostle John to write the book of Revelation simply to prophesy of the coming destruction of Jerusalem, the Holocaust perpetrated against the southern kingdom of Judah, and to alert the few thousand new Christians in the area to flee when the Roman legions appeared on the scene. This teaching omits any word of the upcoming scourge that was, descend, that was to descend upon the Christian church throughout Europe during the ensuing centuries. This is myopic in the extreme. Yes, God did fulfill his word. Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed and one million plus of the southern kingdom of Judah were slain, and tens of thousands of Jews were sold into slavery. For those with eyes to see and ears to hear, the southern kingdom was destroyed. Excuse me, I gotta cough a mud for a moment. Excuse me, I had a dry throat, so that can happen. For those with eyes to see and ears to hear, the southern kingdom was destroyed. The temple sacrificial system was ended. The commandments contained in the ordinances had been fulfilled. As the scripture states in Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26, quote, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Unquote. Well, this little sentence that went before this, for um, the temple sacrificial system was ended. That is a very little sentence that tells you, in these few words, that Daniel's 70th week has been fulfilled by Jesus Christ, right. our Messiah. The sacrifices and oblations were caused to be ceased. That's right. Jesus caused him to cease, and Rome, or rather the Jews, in rejecting Jesus, must have simply tried to sew the veil back together and continue animal sacrifices. That would be the natural expectation of a Christ-rejecting Jewish system. And since Jerusalem and the Jews had rejected their Messiah, and naturally would have returned to animal sacrifices to fulfill the law, then God would use the Roman 10th Legion to completely destroy that temple. 
So we have to ask the question, who destroyed the temple? Was it the Roman 10th Legion or was it God? There is no more sacrifice for sin, the Bible says. Why would God allow the Jews to continue animal sacrifices once Christ fulfilled the law and became the Lamb of God? He wouldn't, or he'd be contradicting himself and minimizing the sacrifice of his son. Common sense. How do you lead the Jews to Christ if you allow them to continue animal sacrifices? To continue animal sacrifices and oblations is to eat and drink damnation to oneself. And that's exactly what the modern nation state of Israel is designed to do. To create a modern nation state of Israel, to have Jews living in the land after being persecuted through the First and Second World Wars. I mean, you can't get the Jews to go back to Israel without the strong right arm of God after how he led them out of Egypt, made the waters part, they walked across on dry land, they had the glory that kept them warm by night and lighted by, or kept them warm and lighted by night and day, manna that fell from the clouds. They knew, the Jews knew that the only way that they could go back to their land is if their God took them out, just like he took them out of Egypt. And they weren't going to go back to any presumed homeland for the Jews unless God himself led them out. They were looking for a Moses to lead them out of, of European persecution under the European Pharaoh. But that Moses never came. And so to get the Jews to move back down to their ancient homeland, since God wasn't leading them there, they had to put the Jews under unbearable persecution, and they did so the First and Second World War. That was one of the main purposes, to persecute the Jews, to force them down there. And then while they were persecuting the Jews and killing the Jews and cremating the Jews in Europe, England was out conquering the Ottoman Empire and kicking the Ottomans out of Jerusalem so the Jews could miraculously go back to Israel. Now we have a modern nation state of Israel. What's next? We've got a modern nation state of Israel with Jews living in the land that say, never again. So what are they going to do? What's the natural inclination? Since they still reject Christ, what's the natural inc inclination? Well, they're going to do just exactly what the Pope needs them to do. They're going to demand a temple and animal sacrifices again. And they're not going to get a temple and animal sacrifices until the Pope says it's okay when the rest of the world is set up to believe this future is fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week and a covenant with the Jews and animal sacrifices and oblations to cease until the world is ready, until all the other elements of the stage are prepared, there's going to be no temple, no animal sacrifices. It's going to come according to Rome's terms, on Rome's timing. And the United States and Great Britain and the rest of the governments of the world are going to cooperate with it. And those that don't cooperate with it, like North Korea and, and Syria, are going to be destroyed. One way or another. Every government of the world is going to submit to the papacy. Every government in the world is going to cooperate with this future 70th week of Daniel. So Rome's still got some mopping up to do before she can perpetrate the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. All right? I think there's a very important thing that we have to consider and that, have our, uh, that our listeners and viewers of the video also have to consider to understand this completely. The Jews returned also to the modern state of Israel because they did not accept 
the New Testament. They did not accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah. That means that the Jewish belief system <clears throat> that is in the world today is still living in the Old Testament. That's right. They are still waiting for their Messiah. So for them, it is nothing strange to rebuild the temple the Romans destroyed. I think we really have to understand that. And the Jews do not put the book of Daniel into the prophetic books of the Old Testament. And we already spoke on the, uh, uh, of this in other broadcasts. There is a rabbinic curse, a curse, the Talmudic curse, that the hands and the fingers of the one who reads Daniel 9 shall his flesh shall, ro shall rot from the bones and his memory shall be taken out of the world uh, out of the world that is a rabbinic curse i can look that up for you if you want to i have a picture on my computer i can look that up in a few moments uh, during tom probably giving nope, a little nope. comment on this yes uh, i can they, show it to you and i will show it in this video also but we have to understand that the jews actually live in the old testament because they don't accept the new and what Rome is trying to do with the refulfillment of Daniel's 70th week is to tell all of us we are living in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ has not come. And therefore, the spirit of Antichrist, as spoken in the Bible, he who denies that Jesus has come in the flesh, that's the spirit of Antichrist. That's why the Roman Catholic Church has the spirit of Antichrist, because with their false fulfillment or refulfillment of Daniel's 70th week, they are denying that Jesus Christ has come and we are all put back into the Old Testamentical times. That's right. And the rabbinic curse that, was, uh, that all of Israel was subject to forbid the searching out of Daniel's prophecies to determine the, the timing of the coming of Messiah. When you read that curse, it will have to do with trying to, to, to decipher when the Messiah would come. I have it right here, Tom. Yep. Okay. Go ahead and read it. May the bones and, uh, of the hands and the bones of the fingers decay and decompose of him who turns the pages of the book of Daniel to find out the time of Daniel, chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. And may his memory rot from off the face of the earth forever. You can read that in the Talmudic Law, page 978, section 2, line 28. And uh, I took this from a video from Walter Veit in the time that was called The Revelation of Jesus Christ in the Total Onslaught series at 1 hour 23 and 27 seconds. So you can look that up for yourself. And... Uh, I also took a look at the Jewish Bible online and it really says that the book of Daniel is not included in the prophetic books. What does that mean? When Daniel was not a prophet, whatever he said was of no avail for the coming of Messiah, right? And that's their denial. And that's why the Jews today are so easily betrayed. They are victims like all of us are victims, if we do not see the truth. We quote-unquote Christians have the advantage of accepting the New Testament. But when we accept the New Testament and when we accept that Jesus Christ had died for us and for our sins on the cross 2000 years ago, why are we looking for a future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week? Why? It absolutely makes no sense. So every righteous Christian should stand up and protest not only the Antichrist who sits in Rome, but also the plans of a rebuilt third temple in Jerusalem. Do you see any of these of this protest anywhere in the world, Tom? Brett? No. No. 
neither do I and probably no, none of my listeners or viewers of this video does. How come? Because I would all, add a little depth. We Go all ahead. feel comfortable in the lie. Yeah. Yeah. The scripture records of the Jews that they knew not the time of their visitation by Christ. They knew not the time of Messiah's coming. That's why they rejected him. And they knew not the time, the very precise timing of the coming of the Messiah, which was widely known among those who read and studied Daniel, in spite of the rabbinic curse. It was the rabbinic curse against the study of the book of Daniel turning the pages of the book of Daniel to discern the timing of the coming of the Messiah. Because Daniel's prophecy positively, perfectly, precisely predicts the exact timing of the coming of Messiah. You couldn't get it wrong. After the 69th week of years, then there would be one last remaining year week after uh, yes one week of years i'm sorry there were people in jerusalem who were actively looking for the messiah they knew the con the precise timing of the coming of messiah daniel we, prophesied it they understood we, daniel's chapter chapter 9 and we can read of those people in the bible tom Certainly. Simeon. Andrew was one of them. Simeon stood, Simeon, at, stood sure. at, the, at the stairs of the temple when uh, yeah. Mary and uh, Joseph were coming on the eighth day to get Jesus yeah. Christ circumcised. Yeah. They were exceptions to the rule. They studied the book of Daniel. They didn't obey the rabbinic curse. They knew the rabbis were not God's people. And they knew the precise timing of the coming of the Messiah. They were expecting him. They were the ones who received him, too. And those who rejected him are one, the ones who followed the direction of the false shepherds in Jerusalem, forbidding them to search the book of Daniel to, to try to determine the, the timing of the coming of Messiah. Now, if you comprehend... How diabolical that is. How can those who name the name of Christ believe in a future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week if they do not likewise deny the precise timing of the coming of Christ 2,000 years ago? I hope by now the listeners can fully, fully comprehend why I say that if you hold to the futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy, that Daniel's 70th week is to be fulfilled yet in the future, you have literally denied that Messiah has come in the flesh. And that is the spirit of Antichrist. That, the Bible says, is the spirit of Antichrist. That is the mind of Antichrist. And where do we get it? from the Roman Catholic Church, from the Antichrist Church. That's where it originates. That's what this book is written all about. This book pr gives us the historical creation of the futurist interpretation of these prophecies. And do you know what it's going to result in? Just as the Jews who knew not the time of their visitation by listening to their false shepherd the Christians of today, that is the vast majority of Christians, professing Christians today, will know not the time of the, of the visitation by Christ the second time. Because they, just like the Jews, will receive the papacy who comes in his own name as the counterfeit Christ as the counterfeit Christ, and only after that, then Christ comes in vengeance. 
Only after they've committed the, the most diabolical abomination. I mean, it's going to be equivalent to the Jews who rejected their Messiah, who knew not the time of the coming of their Messiah. The, the Gentile, quote-unquote, Christians are going to be left in the same dilemma. because they didn't understand Daniel's prophecy in chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. They don't, they don't understand it any better than the Jews did 2,000 years ago. The Jews rejected their Messiah. They knew not that it was the time of their visitation, the 70th week of Daniel, the final the 70th and final week of years of Daniel's prophecy. They didn't know the timing. Daniel gave them the precise timing. Told everything that would happen in that seven-year period of time. And they didn't know it was coming. They were caught unaware. And just like the Christians today who do not know or understand Daniel's 70th week and how and by whom it was fulfilled 2,000 years ago, they'll look for a future fulfillment to receive a false Christ, thereby rejecting the Christ that they profess. History is repeating itself all over again. Deja vu all over again, simply because they don't understand Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 through 27 the 70 weeks of Daniel the very same prophecy that led the Jews to reject their Messiah is the same prophecy that's going to cause ch Christians to reject their Messiah and receive another you talk about irony you would think Satan wrote this script. He did. It's enough to take your breath away. Back to you, Yurik. Thank you, Tom. You know, when Christ saves souls for eternal life, Antichrist destroys souls for eternal damnation. We know that Christ's teaching are to be found in a book that is called the Holy Bible, the King James 1611 authorized version of the Bible, whereas the word of the Antichrist is only to be found in this world, the teachings of man. The choice, dear listener, who of the two do you adhere to, is up to you. That's a choice only you can make. Only you can look into your own heart as God can look into your heart. I cannot look into your heart, no man can look into another man's heart, but God can do that. Search your heart and search who you will adhere to. Do you want to accept Christ with all the consequences in this life and gain eternal life? Or you will you choose Antichrist and get all the gains you can have in this life? And that's it. After that, the punishment. The choice is yours. And in the meantime, the author continues on top of page 38. All agree that the events in 70 AD were shocking and terrible. But there was another holocaust that would soon appear on the horizon. Church historians tell of 50 to 60 million Christians who were killed in the most heinous manner that demonic men could envision during the 1200 through 1300 years when papal Rome held sway to believe that God said nothing of this in scripture is absolute nonsense. 
Right. Now, the mentioning of the 50 to 60 million Christians, I don't want to get into a discussion of numbers because that's redundant. Every one that suffers persecution, every one that dies, is one too many. Okay? So whether it's 50 or 60 million, as the author says here, in the span of 12 to 1300 years on the reign of the Antichrist, or it is 10 times that, or it's even 100 times that, there are so many numbers out there. Some only call the Spanish Inquisition, uh, uh, count the Spanish Inquisition. Some others count all the Inquisitions together, all the wars together and all that. Let us agree on that every one soul is one too many and that persecution was running through the 1200 through 1300 years reign when Popal Rome held sway and still goes on because when the author said that Papal Rome held sway he does not mention that Rome actually holds sway again it was a very short time that the Reformation had its results in our world, world visibly and then came the Counter-Reformation, and the Jesuits took over. And one example of that, one very little example of that, is the confessional of Père de la Chaise, who was the confessional father of the French King Louis XIV, who brought the king to the revocation of the Edict of Nantes and by that to another persecution of the Huguenots. That's just another quote-unquote holocaust. But this Christian holocaust is strange enough a holocaust nobody in the world ever speaks about. The only holocaust that is spoken about in our world is the holocaust of the Third Reich of the persecution of the Jews to establish the plan of the Antichrist, to establish the modern nation-state of Israel. But I agree with the author that we can talk of this 50 to 60 million at least Christians who were killed in the most heinous manner that this also should be called a holocaust. All counter-reformation wars, means all wars that were incited by the Jesuit order, are nothing else but a holocaust. What do you call the frying of 500,000 men, women and children in Dresden in the, in the Second World War? What do you call the 70,000 at least who died in Hamburg in the fiery nights in the bombing of the Second World War? That's a fire sacrifice. That is the expression of a holocaust. And we are speaking about civilians. We are not speaking about people who voluntarily join the military to kill other people. We are speaking about innocent civilians. Men, women and children. <coughs> on the second paragraph on page 38, the author continues, Protestants as a whole have but a vague idea of the terrible persecutions heaped upon the nonconformists by the Roman Catholic Church during the Middle Ages. These non-conforming groups went by a variety of names. Donatists, Anabaptists, Waldensis, Lollards, Hussites, Huguenots, and so on and so on. It is of interest to note that these particular groups actually came through the Reformation and not out of it. These particular groups actually came through the Reformation and not out of it. Very important point. As noted before... Right, they were Protestant before Protestantism was cool. God has always had his protesting people. The Reformation was simply the coming out of Roman Catholics from the Roman Catholic Church to embrace the ancient Protestant faith. That's a concept that we're not instructed in. God has always had his saints who protested the Antichrist of Rome in every generation. 
They are the uncountable multitudes that have died at the hands of the papacy. The Protestant Reformation was just the maturity of the ancient Protestant faith. When Roman Catholics, by the millions, flooded out of the Roman Catholic Church, Roman Catholic monks became Protestant preachers, denouncing the papacy as the Antichrist and denouncing Roman Catholic canon law as the counterfeit law of God. They finally heard the message of all the martyrs of Jesus throughout the centuries. The Protestant Reformation gets a lot of credit, but God has always had his saints, always had his protesters against Rome. Those who predicted the rise of the papacy before the Caesars were even overthrown. And always, in every generation, they've died at the hands of the papacy. The Caesars of Rome, as brutal as they were to the early Christians, cannot hold a candle to the brutality of the papacy. And that papacy, briefly overthrown by the Protestant Reformation, is now in full control again. And what do you propose the papacy might do? Especially if his new world order is challenged by the King James Bible and by King James Bible believers, true Protestants. Back to you, Yerk. Yes, Tom. What you are speaking about, or what the author was speaking about, the Donatists, the Anabaptists, the Valdenses, uh, the, the Vaudois, as they are also called, and the Huguenots and all the others, the Lollards, the Hussites that I just called, those are the ones who were described in Revelation as the woman who fled into the wilderness where God uh, prepared a place for her. Because people like the Valdenses who lived in the Alps or the lower parts of the Alps in Piedmont in the south of France or in uh, northwest of Italy where Piedmont still is today there was a place a place prepared for her those were the remnants of the apostolic church that what the Pope claims to be the apostolic church representative those were the real apostolic remains as noted before, the author continues, if one adds the number of martyrs in the nonconformist groups to the myriad of believers who perished in the protestant churches that had formed or were forming, the number is staggering. Comparing the one million who died in 70 AD in Jerusalem to the 50 or 60 million who died during the reign of Papal Rome throughout Europe over a period of 12 or 1300 years makes the destruction of Jerusalem the temple and the number involved pale in comparison. Another misunderstanding of prophecy relates to the timing and fruits of Christ's second coming. His first coming is found in one of the most important and far-reaching prophecies in all of Scripture. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 we read, quote, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his, his, his heel. Unquote. The fulfillment of that prophecy was the birth, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will destroy the works of Satan and ultimately bring humanity and creation back into proper relationship with God. It should be remembered that this prophecy took 4,000 years to come to pass. The religious leaders of Jesus' day misunderstood the entire event, confusing his first and second coming. They anticipated and eagerly awaited a messianic rule of power and glory, but the first coming to remedy the sin question was dismissed as unnecessary. Were they not the children of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? Did they not have the law of Moses? 
did they not keep the law? Their main interest was political. Get those Romans off our backs. First, they missed an important point in timing. For the second coming to materialize, the first coming must occur and be fulfilled. Secondly, they missed an important spiritual truth. For the political or earthly problems to be addressed, spiritual qualifications had to first be met. As we can read in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 3 and 7, quote, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Marvel not that I said unto thee, he must be born again. Unquote. Today, Christians have no problem with the first coming or with its purpose. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, we read, quote, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Unquote. However, the preterists of today have problems with the second coming, just as the religious leaders of Christ's day had with his first coming. Some take the position that he has come spiritually long ago. Others consider <clears throat> Others consider it their duty to bring in the anticipated kingdom while they await Christ's subsequent return. To accomplish this, the nation must be taught to administer the law of the Lord in all areas of government. It would seem considerable political, uh, it would seem considerable political clout would be needed to bring these results. But well, speaking of politics, Peter's question to Jesus and our Lord's reply in Matthew 19 is most interesting. Therefore we read the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 19, verses 27 and 28. Quote, then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the, gen uh, in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, Ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Unquote. Now you will notice that Jesus did not say, Peter, one more year study with me, and you, me, and you men will be ready to take over positions of leadership in Jerusalem. Timing is extremely important. Quote, in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory. Unquote. This is the second coming when Jesus, among other things, will see that justice is administered throughout the earth. And, wonder of wonders, the apostles in resurrected, glorified bodies will have a political position to judge Israel. While we all long for, work for, pray for and vote for righteous government as christians we are painfully aware that we are still in our adamic bodies we earnestly look forward to the day when quote, this uncorruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality as we can read in first corinthians chapter 15 verse 40, 53 this will happen when Christ truly returns, and we are, quote, raised a spiritual body, unquote, as we can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 44. Then, and only then, are we fit to rule and reign in God's literal kingdom. As we contemplate these tremendous promises, we cry with the Apostle John. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Revelation 22, verse 20. And this brings to an end part one of the book, The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. Before we start part two, the tragic aftermath of futurism, I want to ask Brett and Tom, are there some closing comments to this first part of the book from your side? I guess not. Then I will continue reading on page 43 and starting part 2 of this book, The Tragic Aftermath of Futurism. This part was written by Charles A. Jennings, 
who I told you in the very begin, mentioned on page 46, with the three pages to come, that he wrote another book, the Book of Revelation, from an Israelite and historicist interpretation. And that's a book that I'm going to read one of these days here and maybe on YouTube also. And I hope with the assistance of my brothers who join me in this book. But we will see for that in the future. Now we have to bring down this one and I continue on page 43, the reading. For the last 175 years, the futuristic prophetic viewpoint has been gaining prominence within evangelical Christianity. Yeah, we were speaking about the last 175 years, as you remember. We mentioned 1830, the beginning of the Oxford movement in England, after the Emancipation Act was made through and the Roman Catholic Church has gained freedom of religion again in at that time protestant england and then writers as um, among others henry gretton guinness and uh, james edgen wiley warned of the upcoming uh, danger of the roman catholics in that country and um, not only in that country but all over the world so for the last 175 years the futuristic prophetic viewpoint that has been taught at that time has been gaining prominence within evangelical christianity during that time its influence has increased from a trickle to an overwhelming flood tide in doctrinal statements and evangel uh, evangelistic preaching the curricula of most bible colleges and theological seminaries have totally ignored the prophetic viewpoints of our Protestant Reformation fathers and other great Bible scholars of the past. Instead, they have strictly adopted the viewpoint of prophecy which had its origin among the Jesuit priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church's counter-reformation. It was picked up by the Plymouth Brethren Churches of Great Britain and then brought to the United States and wildly promoted, which influenced multiplied thousands of ministers and laymen alike. Within the last 75 years or so, ever since the fundamentalists accepted futurism, there has been a plethora of sermons and written material that has thoroughly convinced millions of Christians that it is the, tr uh, that it is the truth of God's word. Well, I have a little comment to make here because in the sentence it reads within the last 75 years or so ever since the quote-unquote fundamentalists accepted futurism. Well, in my opinion, you can only be a fundamentalist if you do not make any compromise. So when you do not make any compromise to the word of God, to the Bible, you cannot accept futurism or you are not a fundamentalist. Maybe something to think about. They are so thoroughly convinced that most are more than willing to break fellowship with other believers and even condemn them to the region of the eternal damned and any disagreement or denial of their belief. Very few other religious issues have created more modern Pharisees within the ranks of the body of Christ than this teaching of futurism. Many sincere saints have contacted this ministry and expressed their fear and apprehension to even mention in their church fellowship, <coughs> fellowships their doubts about the rapture. Some have been excommunicated and considered heret as heretics. A classic case is a recent letter that we received from some truth-seeking trembling souls. They wrote, quote, My pastor says there is a rapture before the tribulation. And if I don't believe his way, I can leave the church. Please, please help me. I am very depressed and anxiety-ridden, as is my wife. We are so scared of being kicked out of the church if we disagree with the pastor. Our nerves are, ju are a jumble every time we listen to him. He sends shivers up our spines. I want the truth. I want the truth truth signed by the author of the letter who is not known see these 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 people are having trouble with a strange voice they're used to listening to the shepherd and all of a sudden the shepherd that stands behind the pulpit of their churches doesn't have the same familiar voice as the good shepherd 
And he says, if you don't go my way, you can go the highway. That you're going to find in every, virtually every church in this country. If you hold to the historicist, the traditional, the orthodox teaching of Bible-believing Christians throughout the centuries, you're not going to be welcome in the modern churches. You're going to be asked to leave. And if you don't leave voluntarily, you'll leave by force. They are simply not going to tolerate the truth being told in the churches today. They're not going to tolerate the historical interpretation of Bible prophecy. They believe in the futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy. They believe that God went to sleep 2,000 years ago and won't wake up until the quote-unquote 70th week of Daniel. They believe the book of Revelation is confined to just seven years before Christ's literal return and that God has not fulfilled prophecy throughout the ancient days of the popes. They just simply think that God turned from page 33 to page 2033 and skipped everything in between. And, of course, their delusion guarantees them that they're not going to suffer persecution. They're going to be raptured out before the so-called Antichrist comes. They're not going to let go of it. The rapture candy is so sweet, they will never spit it out of their mouths. And if you suggest that the rapture is a lie, if you suggest that God did not go to sleep for those 2,000 years, if you suggest that Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel perfectly and completely 2,000 years ago, and there is no future fulfillment, you're not going to be asked to leave. You're going to be bounced to the curb, and that's only if they're charitable. These people who call themselves Christians today are so intent on maintaining this delusion that if you threaten it, you threaten their very lives and their very salvation. That's how much they're wrapped up in it. To deny their futurist conception of the 70th week of Daniel is to deny, is to deny them salvation. And when they kill you, they will think they are doing God's service. Thank you, Tom. That was exactly the word that I was looking for. That's because right. Because the, um, the author of this little letter, little letter that I just read to you, he is actually only looking for fellowship, you know? Yeah. And Jesus warned us in John 16, and that's why I'm glad that you picked that up, because I prepared to read this first few verses of John 16. It's, this is Jesus speaking. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father, nor me. But these things have I told you, that when the time shall come, and the time has come, according to the little letter that we just read, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. End of the quote from John Okay, 16. now, let me, can I make a comment please, about that? Please, Re from From your reading, directly from the authorized King James Version of the Bible, who is going to kill God's people? God's people. They said they will kick you out of the synagogues. The people who are in the synagogues. Okay. So who are the ones who are the ones that are going to kill us thinking they are doing God's work? So-called Christians. That's right. Mm -hmm. Gee, the, 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 the prophet has positively identified for us who our persecutors are going to be. Genocide. They are those who can occupy and control the synagogues. The churches, they are Christians, they claim. But the Bible plainly says they know not the Father nor the Son. Why is it they know not the Father? 
because they know not Christ. And why do they know not Christ? Because they believe in a future seventh week and that Jesus has not come in the flesh. They don't believe that Jesus was the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. Well, they profess Jesus, but they don't understand what they've been indoctrinated to believe, to contradict themselves. They preach Jesus out of one side of their mouth. They deny him out of the other side of their mouth by ascribing to futurism. By ascribing to a future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week. That is the same as denying that Messiah has come in the flesh. It is the spirit of Antichrist coming out of the mouths of church-going Christians. And when you try to correct them of this futurist error, when they kill you, they will think they are doing God's service. So who are our mortal enemies? Christians. Church-going Christians. There's no other conclusion that can be drawn. We don't stand to be threatened by atheists or by agnostics or Muslims. God foretold us that our persecutors and those who would kill us are going to be church-going Christians. come from within the own ranks. We don't have to worry about the Muslims. Like I've said on Inquisition Update in the reading and discussion of the current book that I'm reading, Islam rose up against Christianity because Islam regarded the Roman Catholic Church and quote-unquote Christendom as being idolatrous. They worshipped a man, the Pope. They worshipped images and idols of Mary and Jesus. There were statues and paintings all over, quote-unquote, Christendom, where people lit candles and bowed in prayer and held great religious ceremonies with a statue of Mary in the midst of them. They abhorred Christianity for its idolatry. Imagine that. The Muslims abhorred quote-unquote Christendom for their idolatry. And if a Muslim were to come into my house and threaten to kill me because I'm a Christian, all I would have to say, if you can go through my house and all my belongings and find even one image or idol then I will lie down and you can take off my head. And if they went through my house and all my belongings, they would not find one. And that Muslim, by God's grace, would walk out of my house and leave me alone. No, the ones that I have to worry about are the idolatrous Roman Catholic Christians whether they be Baptist or Lutheran or Presbyterian or Methodist or whatever they want to call themselves, they're Roman Catholic in their belief, and they are the ones who will be lighting the auto de fe fires of the last days. And we are intended to be their kindling. And we're not to be offended at Christ for this to happen. He told us a long ago, do not be offended. I've told you before, this is what's going to happen. It's going to be those who claim to be from the house of God who, when they kill you, will think, will think they are doing God's service. And again, like I've said so many times already, this is why the Scripture says, the righteous perish and none perceiveth it. Why does no one perceive it? Because those who call themselves Christians think they did God's service when they killed us. They don't perceive us as the righteous, but God does. It, 
the persecution of the saints is going to come from the Christian churches, every denomination, every single one of them. Just like in the old world order, Tom. Yep. There it was only one church. Now it's different quote unquote denominations, but still the same church that does the persecution. And this is why I tell you, if you walk into any so-called Protestant church or evangelical church and start trying to show them from the scripture that it was Jesus who filled this, fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago, you're going to unceremoniously be kicked out of the church. And if you persist, you will become a mortal enemy. And they will kill you. And they will think they are doing God's service. And when you die, none of them will take it to heart. So you can expect the persecution of the saints to come from the Christian churches. What does that say about the Christian churches? They're not God's people. Yeah, like when Jesus said, um, I want to tell you about the Jews who are not Jews, right? Yeah, exactly. Mm hmm the synagogue of Satan. Okay, I'm going to this is what happens when we allow the Jesuits to tell us what to believe about the scriptures. Because the Jesuits are going to have us denying Christ and have us believing in the Pope. The churches are going to have us denying the gospel and receiving Roman Catholic canon law. Salvation by works, salvation by sacraments, salvation by popes, salvation by priests, salvation by works. No faith required. Just swear an allegiance to the pope and keep his commandments. That's the whole duty of man, according to the papacy. My Bible says, love God and keep his commandments. That's the whole duty of man. And when Christians kill us, they will think they're doing God's service. Nobody's going to miss us. Nobody's going to remember us, except the only one that matters, and that's Jesus, the one who died for us. Back to you, Yerk. Thank you, Tom. I'll continue reading now in the middle of page 44. And I will here and there do a little adjustment when you read along. Within the last 50 years, with the rapid advance in technology, the distress among nations, social, cultural, economic, and uh, social, economic, and cultural unrest, there has been a heightened interest in prophecy with an expectation that something big is about to happen. Prophecy, quote unquote, experts. Oh man. We have many of those in the world, don't we? Yeah, certainly. Prophecy experts have taken advantage of this social, political and religious climate to promote and even cash in on the prosperous prophecy market. Cash in. The money right. gospel. Isn't that yeah. what you over there in the United States of America have? The televangelizers and people like yeah. Joe Osteen and Kenneth Copeland yeah. and flying with one Learjet and, uh, uh, with, with, yeah, every day mm. <laughs> to different yep. meetings and congregations and spreading the word of you can get rich and if you're not rich you are forsaken by God even they preach, right? Yep. <laughs> yep. But Jesus told us we would be left destitute by these Christians and even they would take our lives. All these prophecy uh, experts, if you ask me, have sold out to Satan. That's that's right, they have. The shelves of most religious bookstores are attractively arranged to catch the eye and the pocketbook of the innocent and naive Christian public. Most of this material is promoting futuristic ideas such as a secret pre-tribulation rapture of the church, the rise of a one-man antichrist that makes a covenant with the Jews, 
which he breaks after three and a half years, a seven-year tribulation which is purported to be the 70th week of Daniel, the rebuilding of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem and the reinstitution of the Old Testament animal sacrificial system. I'm sorry, before Tom says a word, this little paragraph sums everything up that we have been speaking about in the previous seven broadcasts, right? Most, You're absolutely right. Most of this yeah. material is promoting futuristic ideas such as a secret pre-tribulation rapture of the church, the rise of a one-man antichrist that makes a covenant with the Jews, which he breaks after three and a half years, a seven-year tribulation which is purported to be the 70th week of Daniel, the rebuilding of the Jewish temple in Jerusalem, and the reinstitution of the Old Testament animal sacrificial system. Dear listener, if you haven't understood anything of all the broadcasts before, when you understand this little paragraph, you understood the whole problem. The definition of futurism. Futurism is that distinctive religious interpretation of Bible prophecy allegedly based upon the messages of um, upon the message of the angel Gabriel as recorded in Daniel chapter 9 verses 20 through 27. It places the fulfillment of the last 19 chapters of the book of Revelation into the future with its starting point at the rapture of the church and lasting for 7 years. This seven-year period is supposed to be the 70th week of Daniel. The futurists utilize other scriptural passages throughout the Bible to support their theory, but mainly Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 through 18, and others, while interpreting all symbols in a literal sense. How did futurism develop? In order to properly understand the historical development of futurism, one must have a general knowledge of the religious climate of the times in which the Roman Catholic Church was most dominant in Europe. Many Bible students of the 13th and 14th century accepted the historicist interpretation of prophecy. This included many teachers who were loyal to the Church of Rome. Many of that time who adhered to the historicist school of thought thought that the beast of Revelation was a symbol of the Roman papacy. See, there you go. There you go. Many Bible students of the 13th and 14th century, including Roman Catholics. Okay, this was the time in which the Roman Catholic Church was most dominant in Europe. The 13th and 14th centuries. This is when, po when Rome was at her height of power. And during that time, and for centuries prior, historicism was regarded as the correct interpretation of Bible prophecy. And that the beast spoken of in the scripture was a symbolic representation identifying the papacy as the beast. This is the historic trouble that the papacy has had even in the Roman Catholic Church. Now, how do you suppose they silenced all the dissent in the Roman Catholic Church who held the historicist interpretation of the Bible prophecy and came to the only correct conclusion that one can come to when reading the Bible? That the papacy is the Antichrist. The papacy is the beast of the Bible. The fourth and final beast on the earth. They had to silence them. The Inquisition started in the Roman Catholic Church against Roman Catholics who held these historicist beliefs. The biblical beliefs. The prophetic belief. They saw in no one other than the papacy the Antichrist. The Inquisition was first used to silence Roman Catholic dissent within the church. When you, when you read prophecy and you comprehend the elemental uh, fact about prophecy, which is simply history foretold, 
that's elemental. I mean, you got to be brain dead if you can't comprehend that. I'm sorry if I've offended somebody, but we, we know common sense tells us prophecy is prophesying the fulfillment of something in history or fu- in the future. That's why we call it a prophecy. So when those fulfillments take place during hit the course of history, we can check them off. This prophecy is fulfilled. That prophecy is fulfilled. That prophecy is fulfilled. That prophecy is not yet fulfilled. And what did they come up with? The natural historical interpretation of the prophecies. First the prophecy is given, then history fulfills them. And what did the conclusion did they come up to? The Catholics, when Rome was in its height of its power in the 13th and 14th century, that the Pope is the Antichrist. And of course this went on until the, the, the 16th century until it finally came to a head and the Catholics left the church in droves at the Protestant Reformation. Okay, I I hope this is sinking in. The historic interpretation of the prophecies is the only correct one. The other two are ridiculous. Preterism and futurism, you got to be kidding me. When, when, when the historical fulfillment of Bible prophecy becomes evident to you through the reading and studying of history, then you wonder how in the world did I ever embrace preterism or futurism? They are ridiculous in comparison to the historic interpretation, the historicist interpretation, the Protestant interpretation the Protestant interpretation. When you hold a historicist understanding of Bible prophecy, you naturally protest the man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn of Daniel, the papacy. See, that's that's why historicism absolutely must be destroyed in the world for the Pope to have his new world order. Every voice that interprets the prophecies from a historical point of view must be silenced at any and every cost. <clears throat> or the Pope's future restoration of the old world order simply cannot happen. You you got to understand that Rome's very survival, the survival of the papacy, the very hope that the Pope will ever rule the world, hinges on whether or not Protestants are destroyed. We're the only dissenting voice. We're the only voice in the world that has ever protested the papacy. The voice of truth must be silenced, Tom. Absolutely. To the nth degree. Now, can you see the potential, the bloody potential of this? Look how much the papacy has invested in this new world order. Look at the sacrifices the papacy made in the First and Second World Wars to achieve this. Look at the sacrifices the papacy has expended in the Vietnam War. For those who have never read it, I highly recommend the book Vietnam, Why Did We Go? You'll find out it was a papal crusade. Look at all the the papacy has its entire history invested in the smooth transition into the whole world accepting the papacy as the 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 vicar of Christ on earth. The kingdoms of this world have their kingships and their crowns invested in making this come to fruition. This futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy a future 70th week of Daniel, where they could present to the whole world a future Christ, denying the historical Christ. They've got everything invested in it, everything. They've staked their very lives on it. And don't you think they're going to tolerate any dissent? 
there was a time of the Protestant Reformation when opposition to Rome was so overwhelming, Rome had to go silent. The Pope even sequestered himself into the Vatican as a prisoner and closed the wall, closed the doors to the, to the, the gates to the city, wouldn't let anybody in or out. The whole world had turned against the Pope. He turned the Vatican into an asylum for himself. That's how close, that's just how close the Protestant Reformation brought the man of sin, the son of perdition, to where he belongs, perdition. And now because of futurism, Protestants have left him out of, this, out of his prison, out of the bottomless pit. And he's just picked up where he left off, conquering the whole world for the Pope. Now the kings of the earth are under, once again, a mandate from the Pope. Conquer all lands for the Pope and silence all dissent. And this is why we have a president of the United States who defends Roman Catholicism. I will fight for you. I will defend you. Again, what? The only enemy the papacy has, Protestantism. The truth. If, if... If yeah. Donald Trump intends to be productive in his quest to defend the Roman Catholic Church, he's got to turn on Protestantism. Now, we're not talking about Baptists and Lutherans. We're not talking about Baptist Catholics, Lutheran Catholics, Church of England Catholics, Presbyterian Catholics. No, we're talking about the body of Christ, the protesters against the papacy, and the Roman Catholic Church, the synagogue of Satan. We are the voice that he has to close. We are the mouths that he has to close. And he's going to do it in the name of Christ. And the churches are going to help him. We may be sitting on the very beginning of the end of the Protestant voice in this country and the world. Because Europe intends to follow the United States' lead in this matter. The European Union is nothing but a, a papal enclave. Yeah, they had just a few days ago, Tom, a celebration for the 60 years anniversary of the Treaty of Rome. Yeah. All the yeah. 28 leaders of the European countries came together and uh, with the Pope in the middle took a photograph in remembrance of the 60-year anniversary signing of the Treaty of Rome, yeah. which is just the reinstallment of the Holy Roman Empire in Europe. Yeah. The re, re, uh, the, the re erection uh, of the old world order in Europe. That's what it is. They have exactly Europe. Exactly what it is. They have Europe. There is everyone who is under control of the Pope here in Europe. And of course, we know that the American president is under control of the Pope, too. Well, he admits that, so there's no disputing that. <clears throat> How can a Protestant president of a Protestant country openly say to Catholics, I will fight for you? That's easy. He's not a Protestant. This I, is not a I Protestant. I know the answer, Tom, but I want the public to answer. <laughs> well, I'm just helping your listeners. <laughs> yeah. I know what you know. We know the answer I, to that I, question. I'm not yeah. putting words in yeah. your mouth. No, I know. No. <laughs> no, we know, we know where this is going. God has shown us enough through history. We can predict the future. I mean, the point that I want to make is, Tom, that when you read something like this, in one of the other broadcasts, I, I, I put this letter in, uh, in there that uh, Donald Trump wrote. How can you over there live in the United States of America and call yourself a protestant when your president says something like this and you don't even protest it? Mm hmm why, and why how, aren't the streets how, filled with people who go out there and say no? Right. And how many Protestants in this country have the sense to realize that Donald J. Trump has just declared a papal crusade against us? 
Oh, man. It's embarrassing. How few. It's a, a shame. Holy war, a holy war against the heretics. Bible believing Christians. It is, do your listeners realize that none of this would be possible were it not for futurism? The belief in a future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel? Well, Tom, if, the whole study of this no book one believed is, in futurism to, and still believed in, if no one believed in futurism and everybody still believed in historicism the way the saints have always believed, the papacy would still be a prisoner in the Vatican. Right. We wouldn't have 1929 signing of the Lateran Treaty yet. Who let the dragon out of the bottomless pit? Protestants! Mm -hmm. Who let the son of perdition out of the bottomless pit? Futurists. Who once were historicists, Bible-believing Christians, and knew who the Antichrist was, and knew how he was deceiving the whole world, and how he was conquering the world for himself, to force every man, woman, and child on the planet to worship him, not Christ. Now do you see why they need a future fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week? There has to be a formal declaration at some point in history that the Pope is Christ's vicar on earth and we ought to all bow down and worship him just like the priests of Rome do, just like all Roman Catholics do. None of it would be possible without futurism. Preterism too, but the, in, matter, in comparison, few believe in preterism anymore. Futurism now is the, the, the name of the game. You can't walk in the door of any church and not hear the futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy. The future 70th week of Daniel. A future temple. Future animal sacrifices. A future peace treaty with the Jews. You, it's all a lie. Every bit of it, everywhere you go, it's 24-7, 365. It's on every channel. You can't tune it out. It's everywhere you look, it's everywhere you walk, it's everywhere you talk, it's in everything you read and everything you see. And the truth is rejected as heresy. The ancient truth of the saints of Almighty God is rejected nowadays universally by Christians to be heresy. We're a threat to their rapture. We're a threat to their future 70th week of Daniel. We're a threat to their very salvation. Now you know why General Donald J. Trump says he's going to fight for the Roman Catholic Church. He believes in that future Christ. He believes in that papal Christ. It's a stunning state of affairs. You can't, words can't even describe. The heart can't comprehend it all at once. The horrors that have beset the body of Christ. It's, it's, it's equivalent to the Jews finally rejecting Jesus. What a horror. We've all read in our Bibles how the Jews sought to kill him. And the Jews who said we have no king but Caesar. Do you realize now the Protestants say we have no king but Caesar? It's deja vu all over again. The Protestants of today know no more about their, their coming visitation than did the Jews who rejected Jesus 2,000 years ago. It's that bad. That's not an exaggeration. That's literal facts on the ground. It's visible. Undeniable. 
They are just as blind and stiff-necked as were the Jews who stoned Jesus, who crucified Jesus. I, I think people think uh, that I raise my voice and say these outrageous things just to entertain myself. Do you realize I'd rather be doing anything than what I'm doing right now? I'd rather be doing anything than what God has saddled me with to do. Because what I'm doing puts me at odds with all of Christendom. It makes me a mortal enemy of all of Christendom. It makes me a mortal enemy of my local government, my county government, my state government, my federal government, and the world government. It makes me a mortal enemy of the whole stinking world. Even to your own family. Even to my own family. But proceed I must. And if I ever grow weary of it, God's going to take me home. This isn't about me. This is about this book. And when I'm gone, God will just raise up another voice. Maybe more easy to listen to than mine. Maybe not as emotional as mine. But another voice indeed. The truth will not be silenced in this world. So long as the sun shines in the sky, the moon shines at night, and the world exists. God's truth will never be taken out of this world. And though they endeavor to silence every historicist, every true Protestant on the face of the earth, God will raise up stones to give him glory. Let Back to you, Yurt. Let the stones cry out, I tell Indeed. Indeed. There is a sentence in Latin that sums it all quite interestingly up. Mundus vult de cipi, ergo de cipiatur. Which means in English, the world wants to be deceived, so let it be deceived. Most people, when they are given a choice of living a pleasant life and a lie, or a hard life and the truth, what do they choose? The pleasant one. Of course. Yeah. It's easy. It's easy. You don't have to think about it. You wake up in the morning and everything's already figured out. You don't have to think for yourself, eh? Nope. That makes it all easy. Yeah. Okay, going back to the book. The historicist school of thought taught that the beast of Revelation was a symbol of the Roman papacy. It was this interpretation that was later adopted by the Reformation fathers of the 14th to 16th centuries. Now we go into a little list that includes such verses as John Wycliffe, 1329-1384, through 1384, the morning star of the Reformation. And by the way, for the people who do not know, a little 40 years after his death, of course he was persecuted and he was killed by the Roman Catholic Church. And 40 years after that, they dig up his body and they grinded his bones and burned them and the dust they put into the river. That's how far their revenge goes. They being the Roman Catholic Church. Yes. The Roman Catholic Church dug up John Wycliffe 40 years after his demise. 
They dug him up. They put him on trial. They convicted him once again of heresy. They burnt his body. They ground his bones to powder. And they threw them in the river. The Roman Catholic Church did that. We need to be specific who it is that persecutes the saints. Back to you, Yerk. John Knox, who lived between 1514 and 1572, who was a Scottish Presbyterian reformer. William Tyndale, who lived between 1494 and 1536, a reformer, a Bible translator and a martyr. He died some 25 kilometers from the place where I live, over here in Belgium, in Vilvorde, at the stake. And his last words were, O Lord, open the King of England's eyes. And a year after that, King Henry VIII of England ordered every Anglican church in England to have the English Bible in there. The very first time that Bible was translated into the vulgar tongue of the people officially in England at that time. Martin Luther between 1483 and 1546 who was a German reformer. John Calvin 1509 until 1536 a French theologian and reformer. Ulrich Zwingli 1484 through 1531, a Swiss reformer, and Philip Melanchthon, 1497 until 1560, who, among others, wrote the Augsburg Confession. Sir Isaac Newton, from 1642 through 1727, an English scientist and Bible scholar. John Huss, 1373-1415, who was a Bohemian reformer. John Fox, 1516 through 1587, who wrote Acts and Monuments, to you probably better known as Fox's Book of Martyrs. John Wesley, 1703 through 1791, father of Methodism. Jonathan Edwards, 1703 through 1758, pastor and the first Great Awakening. George Whitefield, 1714 through 1770, who was an English evangelist. Charles G. Finney, 1792 through 1875, American evangelist. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, 1834 through 1892, English Baptist pastor. And Matthew Henry, from 1662 through 1714, a Welsh Bible scholar. And let me assure you, this list is far from complete. Names as Henry Gretton Guinness, James Aitken Wiley, Froome, who we also cited in this book, and many others are not mentioned here. The above names are far from being a complete list of great Bible scholars, pastors and evangelists who believe the historicist approach to prophecy with some lasting through the 19th century and well into the 20th century. We are living today in the 21st century and the only author that I can remember that I read from the 21st century books of, at least partially, who I would not even include into this list completely, but who wrote a very really revealing book is P.D. Stewart and his code word Babylon in two parts, a book that I will surely go to read on my channel in the future. The advocates of historicism view the 70 weeks of Daniel as being completely fulfilled in the old Judah nation and ending in 34 AD. This little sentence sums up the whole purpose of the complete book. The advocates of historicism view the 70 weeks of Daniel as being completely fulfilled in the old Judah nation and ending in 34 AD. It also views the book of Revelation as portraying a survey of the overall history of the Christian church. It would include the major events of European history, including the Roman Empire, Papal Rome, the rise of Mohammedism, 
the Protestant Reformation, the development of Christian Western civilization and the future consummation of God's plan of the ages in the city of New Jerusalem of Revelation, chapter 21 to 22. With the brutality and iniquity of the papacy being exposed for so long through the powerful influence of the reformers, Rome was forced to do something to counteract this campaign in order to maintain its stranglehold on the common people and monarchs of Europe. A short and clear explanation is given in the book Revelation, Four Views, a Parallel Commentary, edited by Stephen Gregg, pages 31 through 32. Quote, Coming to the defense of the papacy, Spanish Jesuits represented, uh, presented two alternative approaches to the historicism of the reformers. One response was that of Francisco Ribera, 1537 through 1591, a professor of, uh, at Salamanca in Spain, who taught that John in Revelation only foresaw events of the near future and of the final things at the end of the world but had none of the intervening history in view. The Antichrist was defined as a future individual who would arise in the end times. Babylon was seen as Rome, not under the popes, but in a future corrupted state. This was the beginning of many of the ideas that are now a part of the futurist approach to Revelation. Unquote. In 1826, the librarian to the Archbishop of Canterbury, S. R. Maitland, discovered Francisco Rabira's writings and published them. This theory of the postponement, or postponement of the Antichrist and the tribulation period into the future had already been taught for 250 years by the Jesuits. To add fuel to the fire of futurism, another Jesuit named Emmanuel Lacunza published his book entitled the coming of the Messiah in glory and majesty in 1860. Tom and I were speaking in earlier broadcasts already about this. La Kunza, who, along with other fellow Jesuits, had been expelled from, uh, from Chile for their encouragement of treachery and violence. He wrote his book under the name of Rabbi Ben Ezra, a supposedly, a supposedly converted Jew. He added a prayer asking the Almighty to use his book for the enlightenment of the Jewish people. La Kunza set forth the theory that Jesus was to have a future two-stage coming, once for his saints and then with his saints at a later date. The ultimate result of the writings of Ribera and La Kunza were that 1. The events of Revelation 4 verse 1 and uh, following were to take place in the future. Second, the appearance of the Antichrist and the two witnesses and relative prophecies also in the future. Third, all these prophetic events are scheduled to transpire in a very short space of seven years between the first and second comings of Jesus. Four, the rapture of the church is to take place as a future event, which will be the starting point for all the other events to follow. Now Lacunza's book came into the hands of Edward Irving, a young and brilliant Scottish Presbyterian minister during the 1820s. He accepted the task of translation of this devious theory from Spanish into English. Irving was very much aware of the true identity of Lacunza as being a Spanish Jesuit and not a converted Jewish rabbi. Still, he continued to translate and publish a theory that would turn out to be one of the most detrimental misconceptions of Scripture in the 2,000-year history of the Christian Church. When he published his English version in London in 1827, he claimed he heard a voice telling him to preach to seek a secret rapture of the Church with the two-stage theory of Christ's future comings. Only three years later, in 1830, Margaret MacDonald, a young Scottish lassie, supposedly had a revelation by means of a vision from God in her 
quote unquote vision, she saw Jesus coming in a secret rapture to remove the righteous saints from the planet Earth. So many mistakes in this little sentence. <laughs> At the time she was attending a church that was connected with the Brethren movement of which Edward Irving was closely associated. Naturally, Irving seized upon this vision as a witness to, to his teaching and began to spread this theory even more enthusiastically. In 1833, in the city of London, meetings were being conducted by some Irvingite followers. Among those invited to the meetings was John Nelson Darby, who possessed a keen interest in prophecy and had exceptional writing skills. Soon he became convinced of the Irving Guide teachings of a secret rapture and other futuristic interpretations of prophecy originated long before by the Jesuits. Now Darby began to publish and distribute his newfound secret rapture theory. He eventually made five trips to the United States and convinced many new converts, among them being Cyrus Ingerson Schofield, a one-time law student turned preacher. This new theory of prophetic interpretation was introduced to the Bible conferences that were being conducted in the late 19th century. From this venue was the springboard for advancing this theory to the American Evangelical Church world. And here follows a quote from Rankin MacDougall, who was one of Scotland's well-known Gaelic scholars holding linguistic degrees in Latin, Greek, Hebrew and Gaelic, from his book The Rapture of the Saints. Quote, I will venture to assert that there is not a Bible teacher nor anyone else living in the world today who has found a secret rapture in the Bible by his own independent study of the Bible itself. These teachers all come to the Bible with cut and dry theories which they have learned elsewhere and twist and torture texts to, find, uh, to fit the theory. If the spiritual pedigree of the futurist Bible teachers could be traced back, they would all be found to spring from one source, Lacunza, the Jesuit. Unquote. Now, with this little quote of the Rapture of the Saints, in the middle of page 49, I will end this broadcast here and ask my two participating brothers in Christ for any closing comments before we come back another time for the further reading from page 49 probably until the end. Brett, is there a comment that you would like to give to the end please? Sure, yes, I just uh, really am blessed to hear this message and, and uh, I just really appreciate all the time that you have put together in preparing this along with Tom and Looking forward to future uh, recordings, and we'll see what comes our way. I'd, I wish uh, that I wasn't so busy here, but it's just a reality that I'm living through. <laughs> no problem. At least you have time to watch the videos when they come out. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> Music to my ears. Tom, final thoughts? Okay. Yes, uh, final thoughts is many of your listeners will already recognize that this author is simply repeating the same story as told by Owen, the earlier author in this book, that this is uh, just the second witness to the truth regarding the evolution, the birth and evolution and progress of futurism by the Jesuits and how it was brought into Protestant Christianity. So we have two independent writers, just two. There are multitudes of others, but this book includes just two, and they say exactly the same thing. And uh, we know the origin and the development and the introduction 
of futurism into the Protestant churches is nothing but the works of the Jesuits, the Counter-Reformation. Declared at the Council of Trent, begun at the Council of Trent, just some 45 years after Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church and starting the Protestant Reformation. Rome raised up her Jesuits as her warriors to counter the Reformation. And knowing that Killing, public killings of heretics did more harm to the Roman Catholic Church than it did good. They had to resort to peaceful means to destroy Protestantism. And so they had to infiltrate the Protestant churches with lies, poisonous lies, cancerous lies that would eventually result in the complete destruction of Protestantism without having to raise a bloody finger. And it has accomplished its goal. Futurism and preterism, both the master weapons of the Jesuits, and they have caused the Protestant Reformations to repute the Reformationists, the Protestants, to repudiate their own rebellion against the papacy. And so now, the Jesuits called Vatican Council II to declare victory and to issue an ultimatum. Now that you believe in a future Antichrist, you've exonerated the papacy, now you must, you must come back to the Roman Catholic Church. Not only that, you must adhere to Roman Catholic canon law, you must bend the knee to the Pope, and you must restore to him everything that you robbed from him at the time of the Protestant Reformation. And not only to restore Europe, but the rest of the world for the Pope, the vicar of Christ on earth. And I've just explained to you all the history that has transpired since Vatican Council II in 1965. This once Protestant nation has become a crusader and a battle axe for the Pope. Not only have we helped to restore Europe through the European Union to become once again a vassal of the Pope, but we are now conquering the rest of the world for the papacy. And whatever pretense they put upon the wars of the future, they will be truly for one purpose and one purpose only, to mop up the last remaining dissenters in the world in preparing for dis di announcing the papacy to be the answer, to be the fulfillment of Daniel's 70th week prophecy. You don't have to be a prophet to be able to predict what Rome is going to do. We have enough fulfilled Bible prophecy in our history to accurately predict what lies in store for the future without any further revelation from the Lord. We'll take further revelation, but it's not necessary. We already know where it's going. We can see where it's been. We can see where it is now, and if you draw a line between those two points, you can extend it right on out into the future. And what lies at the end of that line is a global papal dictatorship, a false Christ over a global Christendom, and the universal rejection of Jesus as the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. If you can comprehend what I've just said, I'd like to hear from you. My email address is tom at cwaves.us. That's tom at s-e-a-w-a-v-e-s dot u-s. And if you wish to hear more on a daily basis, tune in Monday through Friday at 10 o'clock Central Time. I'm not sure what that is in UTC, I think 1,500 hours. For an hour every day, we'll continue to tell the truth, exposing futurism, 
and preterism as Jesuit lies to destroy the Protestant Reformation and to put the Pope not as the Antichrist, but as the Christ on earth. Until we meet again, blessings in the name of the one and the only one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Messiah, the Lamb of God, the real and only King of kings and Lord of lords. In Jesus' name, thank you, Yerk. I'll see you next time. Thank you very much, Tom, for visiting today and uh, sharing with me this reading and discussion of the book The Origin of Futurism and Preserism, also to Brett Norman who you can reach uh, via his YouTube channel, and I will provide the link in the description box of this video. And once again, as uh, already multiple times uh, in the video mentioned, of course, uh, you can reach Tom directly via email, tom at cwaves.us, and um, that email address, of course, is also uh, provided for you in the description box of the video. And me, you can reach, as usual, through the comment section of the video or send a personal message via uh, my YouTube channel. This was part 8 of the origin of futurism and preterism and I'm looking very much forward to meet my two brothers to a continuation and ending of this study and uh, hopefully many more studies in the future to give you all the wisdom that can only be found in the Bible. There are secular writers like Paul Owen, who read the first part, and Charles Jennings, who write this book, or James Edgar Wiley, or Henry Gretton Guinness, or Michael de Semlian, or whoever, secular writers who can help you understand what actually is all written already in the Word of God. The uncorrupted, only true preserved Word of God today in the 21st century in 2017, the 1611 authorized King James Version of the Bible. Until next time, I thank you very much for watching and listening. And always do your own studies, please. Always do your own research. Until next time, God bless you and bye-bye. We must start at the foot of the cross. For our souls in danger, we're at loss. And when we kneel in that awesome place, at that very moment, you'll feel God's grace. Friend, let me tell you, you need to know, there is heaven, also hell below. Christ died on that cross to set you free from your vile sins and hell's agony. You're God's enemy without the cross. Reject Christ and to God your dross. Prison of hell he will send, just Christ's work on the cross makes amends. God hates those who try to enter in, the gates of heaven still full of sin. Only his son can take sin away, go to the foot of the cross this day. God has provided only one way to enter heaven's wondrous array. Except what Jesus did for us all, he paid our debt, so hell won't befall. Go to the foot of the cross this day, his precious blood washes sin away. We each need to think more of his cross, without our Savior, we're total lost.